So um, uh, now you can see the SDG goals. So it's uh, about clean water, clean energy, responsible consumption and production and uh, climate action. So at least four of them uh, we try to cover in our um, work. Uh, so actually, I, um, to warm you up a little bit, I would like to start by uh, showing you the short journey or the short version of the journey that we have uh, been doing, how comes that we started to work with microalgae? Because maybe many of you know um, that for many, many years I have been working with plants. So uh, as you can see, the title, the general title of our um, research is about regulation of photosynthesis and renewable biomass production. The short name would be PhotoBio. And uh, I'm really happy to celebrate together with you 10 years since uh, my research group has moved from Linköping University to Gothenburg University. And this is a very elegant uh, photo from our, uh, uh, from the professor installation um, here in Gothenburg. So this is very nice uh, opportunity that this um, month we celebrate 10 years. Um, okay, so the common research team in our lab has to do with variable light. How do algae and how do plants cope with the variable light in their natural environment? They, as we can see, they are able to uh, grow uh, in quite uh, fluctuating conditions. And we study this on molecular level. I don't want to scare you with much uh, photosynthesis, but a general principle is that algae and plants, in order to grow, which means to produce biomass, they need all the time to adjust how much light they utilize for photosynthetic electron transport and how much they actually dissipate as heat because they are not able, if they get a lot of light, to use it all. Part of it will be dissipated. So um, this uh, kind of principle, how much light goes to photosynthesis, how much is uh, dissipated as heat, we have very much used in our research uh, about ion channels and transporters. So this kind of proteins that can transport charges across membranes. And a uh, very talented PhD student, Andrei Herdan, he has used Arabidopsis thaliana and uh, a very sophisticated chlorophyll fluorimeter to study wild type and mutants that either lack or overexpress a channel. And uh, he designed um, a software where he can follow the heat and the photosynthesis while light is fluctuating between low and high intensities. And he could see that uh, as compared to the wild type, the mutant and the overexpressing one, they uh, uh, behave differently. This tells us that plants are able to see, to detect the changes in light intensity, and they do this with the help of ions. Very nice. But then we had the, this uh, uh, research group of uh, Anna Gute that sadly passed away. Um, and a very talented PhD student, Susanna Gross, I don't know if she's in the audience, audience that gave uh, Andre some samples of West Coast Skeletonema marinoi strains. So Andre changed the setup from the leaf, he used the cuvet. And in the cuvet, we had this uh, beautiful uh, chain forming diatom, Skeletonema marinoi. We had, he tried different strains and he did similar experiment as for uh, the Arabidopsis. And you can see a similar type of behavior. They do sense the low and the high light. And uh, very interesting, we have found one strain that is called Hakefjord that you will hear quite a lot about it later on um, in my presentation, that seems to be the best, is the green one that has the best photosynthesis, that has the best, uh, fastest heat dissipation. 
So uh, what we thought when we saw these results, aha, uh -huh, the West Coast microalgae strains are actually quite robust, uh, very responsive to these extreme changes in uh, light. So uh, I can summarize that in our research group, we work with quite many different types of organisms. Of course, our long-term experience is with Arabidopsis. But more recently, we started to work with the model green alga called Chlamydomonas. Uh, and also for application purposes with West Coast microalgae from a collection that is available here uh, on the fifth floor uh, from the marine department. And um, what we have focused mostly in this collection is on the local species and strains such as Skeletonema and uh, some others like Nanochloropsis, um, and a close relative of the green algae. That's why you see it in green color. And we use, uh, of course, we need to grow them in uh, controlled conditions. So we use so-called multi-cultivators here. So microalgae, so they are, uh, of course, fascinating for us uh, for basic research, but they are actually a sustainable resource for, as you can see, many, many purposes. Uh, in my title, I had food and I had bioenergy, but uh, microalgae have much more potential. They can be used for nutraceuticals, cosmetics, fertilizers, for animal feed, for bioplastics, feedstock, and so on. And uh, yeah, we know so much about plants. So are microalgae better than plants? Because in a way, the same uh, resource can be used for uh, plants. And microalgae have some advantages. Um, as you know, they grow on water, so they do not require uh, arable land, no competition with the agriculture. They can use many different types of sources. They can use different sources of car carbon dioxide. Uh, they have a much faster division and uh, turning over time. They are much more productive, as you can see from this graph here, as compared to uh, some other uh, crops. And uh, they produce uh, higher content of valuable compounds. You see here, uh, lipids uh, seem to be the major uh, constituent of the microalgae. Um, okay, so what about the lipids and microalgae? Are there other sources than uh, plants? to get uh, lipids? And the answer, yeah, we actually have uh, yeast. You can have uh, fungi, bacteria. Uh, but as you can see, microalgae, uh, they are able to produce like these others, um, saturated fatty acids and also monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, and in addition, they can also produce polyunsaturated fatty acid. Um, when we say lipids, what we actually mean mostly are these molecules called three glycerides. So they have a glycerol molecule that is esterified with fatty acids. And if this, uh, this can be uh, saturated, mono or polyunsaturated. Just for bioenergy, biodiesel, uh, are most relevant the saturated and especially the monounsaturated fatty acids. And microalgae are rich in this. Uh, to be able to produce the biodiesel, what you need is to um, release these fatty acids by a, a reaction with the methanol. So you'll have the free fatty acids or methylated fatty acids and glycerol. So glycerol is a byproduct of uh, biodiesel production that could be actually used, uh, as you will see later on uh, in uh, my presentation. And then here, the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are really of tremendous importance for our diet. And here you may recognize some names like uh, EPA and DHA. So microalgae are a valuable source of uh, uh, various types of lipids, really broad potential. Okay, so before we started with our research, we said we need to see if there is a need for uh, microalgae research. 
Uh, is there a need to produce bioenergy and food in a sustainable way? And uh, um, just if we should summarize three of the major needs. So the biorefineries, uh, as you know, this is also a recommendation um, from, uh, uh, from the government, they need to increase the proportion of renewable biomass. Uh, and uh, they need also, um, there is actually need to complement the biomass from the paper industry because that one doesn't have the right fatty acid composition. So it's uh, nice to combine microalgae with the other existing sources to produce biodiesel. Then uh, the seafood farms and industry, uh, they produce uh, tremendous amounts of water, which are very rich in both inorganic and organic compounds, and they need uh, to be, or they could be reused. But for this, you need biological filters, such as microalgae, to clean the water before you would release it back into the ocean. In addition, the seed farms, they need food, they need more food uh, for the fishes. So we concluded that, yes, there is a need for microalgae uh, research here. So we applied funding. I only show you the successful grants uh, from uh, private foundations. Uh, we got grant in 2017. And then from the Swedish Energy Agency, we got uh, a grant for two years. So overall, our objectives have been uh, to screen local West Coast collections for marine microalgae uh, and find those that are most productive in terms of biomass and lipids. And if it's possible to develop an energy efficient cultivation system for the marine environment on the West Coast. So our ambitious long-term goal was to cultivate the microalgae, make biomass and deliver uh, or offer a system to uh, deliver it to industry to make it more sustainable. So uh, how, how comes that we want to do it on the west coast of Sweden? Uh, well, we have, as you can see in this picture, a lot of resources, local resources. We have water, seawater, and we have a lot of uh, various microalgae species and strains that are very well adapted to the local climate. And uh, they like it to be here. They bloom in different seasons. And these blooms are dominated by Skeletonema marinoi. It's a beautiful chain forming diatom with a silica cell wall. Uh, but we can even find other species that uh, in the literature for other countries are very famous for biofuel applications. So we were very happy that a nanochloropsis uh, species is present here in the West Coast. Uh, so this would be the motivation. And what do these microalgae do right now there? Yeah, they represent the feed for the zoo uh, plankton. But uh, what about using them for uh, other purposes, for human uh, need? So our idea well, here on the West Coast, we have quite extreme variations in uh, light and temperature, as you can see here, between even uh, within the same season. Um, so we have extreme uh, climate, but we have access to a collection, uh, Guma collection at the Marine Department, that includes actually 166 strains um, and even more than 100 of other species. And they all have been isolated from the West Coast in different seasons, on different sites, and they have a proven genetic diversity. So it means they should be able to tolerate these extreme conditions so we could maybe search for the species strains that are suitable for an outdoor cultivation to make it energy efficient to produce biomass year round. And then the other question that we try to address, what would be the potential of this biomass? Can we use it for food? Can we use it for bioenergy? And that would depend on their lipid and maybe protein content. So how we started the project, we started it here uh, 
in uh, our department with, together with Otilia, the main hero here. Uh, she worked with 166 strains of Skeletonema uh, and some others at the Guma collection. And by growing them under standard conditions in flasks, she reduced the number to 19 of Skeletonema. And we also added this uh, very promising Nanochloropsis uh, granulata strain. So then she moved to um, cultivate these 20 strains in more controlled conditions, multi-cultivator, uh, and uh, looked more detail at their biomass, lipids, photosynthesis, and reduced the number to two. So you probably recognize this name, Haki Fjord. So the beautiful uh, strain that was so nicely uh, doing photosynthesis is uh, the so-called SM142 strain. So uh, it turned out that Susanne gave us for the first preliminary experiments, one of the best strains. So we took these two strains and we moved to rice. They have uh, um, even more sophisticated systems, uh, photobioreactors, uh, where we try to uh, cultivate and uh, follow the biomass production and composition in SRUI growth seasons. And I will come back to why SRUI and not four. So um, as I told you before, we have divided the um, we have extracted the data from uh, SMOE for uh, 2014 and 2016. <clears throat> and uh, based on the light and temperature, uh, we have um, uh, estimated the average uh, for very values for these parameters and divided the year in three, summer, winter, and spring, uh, that uh, where we try to mimic the light intensity during the day uh, and the temperature we have kept uh, constant. So this is an average temperature. And this light we could mimic uh, using computers at uh, rise in the photobioreactors. So the experiments, the data that I will be showing, they are in simulated growth seasons. So this is how the phot photobioreactors look like, about uh, they had one liter. Uh, we actually used the CO2 enriched air, one, two percent. We used seawater from Christina Bar, and we added uh, enriched uh, nutrient medium. Uh, so the first uh, uh, data that Otilia has obtained, they are about productivity. So how much biomass they can produce per liter per day for those two strains in summer, winter, and spring. And you see the data here. They are speaking by themselves. So in summer, nanochloropsis was the best, uh, most productive strain. In winter, of course, the numbers are much lower, but skeletonema grew better. So you can see the different uh, behavior. Whereas in spring, they were more or less similar in productivity. Uh, what Otilia with the rice team also looked uh, at was how much nutrient they take from the media. And they looked at nitrate and phosphate, the major um, important nutrients. So uh, again, they are shown in the three seasons. And overall, what you can see is that the best uh, nutrient uptake is in the summer that correlates with the better growth. Uh, another observation that you can make if you follow the uh, brown colors is that the skeletonema strain takes much better the phosphate in all conditions. So this uh, would suggest uh, potential applications of our uh, two species for remediation of wastewater. Uh, of course, it has to be uh, salt water, so it would be from the seafood farms and industry. So great potential here. Then we looked at the composition of the biomass. You can have an idea here about the color and the density. So uh, uh, what we could see, of course, the biomass seems to vary with the season and between the species. 
But overall, if you look at the um, blue color, you can see that skeletonema seem to be a much better source for proteins. It can produce up to 62%. Nanochloropsis seems to be, it's good for protein, but it's actually compared to skeletonema much better for lipids. You can get almost 60% lipids in the biomass. Um, then we also looked at the fatty acid uh, content, how much of this uh, dry weight would be fatty acids. And again, there is variation between species and seasons. And most uh, fatty acid content we had in the summer. And fatty acid, as you remember, we talked that these are important for uh, uh, biodiesel. So then we measured their calorific value. So what we could see, the best value for um, skeletonema and for nanochloropsis were these ones. And we compared them with the fossil fuel. And we could learn that the skeletonema, that would be equivalent of firewood, whereas nanochloropsis would be the equivalent of coal. Uh, so they are, uh, would be maybe very good as comp to complement um, other sources of uh, uh, biodiesel. So 25 of uh, millijoule per kilogram is not so bad, in fact. So application would be bioenergy. Uh, what uh, Otilia also did, this was in a follow-up project. We, uh, of course, to show you the previous data, we just looked at the final uh, time point, how much biomass, what the composition is, but here we looked even during the growth, how uh, are they growing, how much biomass they produce and how much fatty acids. So overall, what we could learn is that skeletonema uh, seems to, it grows very nicely during summer, it grows during winter, and you see a clear increase in the uh, fatty acids uh, in time during the growth. If we compare the seasons, it seems to be almost as productive in uh, winter as in summer. So it's uh, very tolerant, uh, very robust strain. Nanochloropsis, this is a strain that is able to grow very well. Uh, so you see really a burst in the um, OD here, in the fluorescence here. Um, the lipid content, it's very high almost from the beginning uh, in the summer. But look here in winter, does not produce, produce much biomass. The lipid seems to be more or less the same, but we can see that it is actually growing slowly. It is able to withstand winter. And we try to uh, find out why, how comes it doesn't die. It's there, you can imagine it, probably right now on the west coast, nanocoropsis is surviving. So how, how do they respond to the winter? Why is, why is skeletonema better in winter than nanocoropsis? Anything that has to do with the fatty acid composition? So uh, we looked in detail together with Matt Anderson uh, here in our department at the uh, fatty acid composition. And we start with skeletonema we compare it between summer and winter. First of all, what you see is that um, uh, there is a very broad uh, distribution. We have about eight types that are dominating. And the most abundant one is uh, C16 uh, with one unsaturated uh, bond, uh, which actually we can see that it goes down in winter. Um, instead, what goes up in winter is EPA that uh, we mentioned to be very important for uh, diet. So interestingly, it seems that for skeletonema to withstand winter, they remodel their lipids. They increase their polyunsaturated fatty acid to 50%. And uh, dominating this PUFAS would be the EPA. So that's why they do it so well there in winter. So what about nanochloropsis? And of course the application could be for biofuel in the summer or diet in the winter. So what about nanochloropsis that didn't grow very well in winter? Here we see actually fewer species, only four. 
And what we can see is a different lipid remodeling to withstand the winter. They make in winter more monounsaturated fatty acid. 50% of them are MUFAS and is dominated by C161. Um, and the EPA content was quite high from the beginning and is very stable uh, between summer and winter. So the application uh, that would be suggested here, the fatty acid profile in summer is excellent for biofuel production and for diet would be in both seasons. Okay, so the data that I have been showing you so far, they were obtained in uh, photobioreactors where we used uh, enriched uh, CO2. Um, and then what we actually didn't know is what would have been the productivity if we just use normal layer? Uh, and would it be possible to further increase this productivity if we use uh, not inorganic, but organic carbon that uh, is so abundant in the wastewater from industry? So would it be possible to get even higher numbers for the uh, productivity and what would be these numbers in normal air? So to answer these questions, there is a process called mixotrophy. Uh, this picture I took from a, a very nice uh, mini review that Valeria and I have recently submitted. So uh, what we can learn here is that in this process, there are two organelles important, chloroplast and mitochondria that kind of help each other. So it is possible that one is using CO2, the other one is using organic carbon to activate both the respiration and the photosynthesis. So how would be, we know very well how things happen in photosynthesis, but if you get organic carbon, then what happens is that this has to go through the respiration to make ATP. And this ATP can be sent to the chloroplast and used to drive the carbon fixation. It will lead to more growth and more uh, fatty acids. This would be very important to use organic carbon when light is limiting and photosynthesis does not work uh, at optimal conditions. So uh, then what Valeria did, wow, okay, so we have mixotrophy. Is it possible to use it for our strains? So first she screened the literature and found that there are many species of diatoms. They can grow phototrophy, mixotrophy, heterotrophy. And as organic sources, again, it's a broad range of uh, substrates that they can use. And you can also see that there is documented uh, application uh, for them. So among these uh, species, the closest uh, to the ones that we are interested would be Skeletonema costatum. Uh, and the other one, Nanochloropsis. So there is literature for this one as well. It seems to, there is a, another species called Nanochloropsis gaditana that is actually edible and can grow in mixotrophy, it can use organic carbon and uh, can produce uh, valuable carotenoids and EPA. So then our question, can we grow our two strains, favorite strains in mixotrophy? Would they produce more biomass? And could this be of a greater potential? And this gave rise to another project that we uh, happily got funding from uh, Marie Curie Fellowship. This is the work of uh, Valeria. So uh, in her work uh, in the project MMM Rebio, we try to investigate whether nanochloropsis can be cultivated mixotrophically in summer and whether skeletonema can be cultivated mixotrophically in winter. So we tried these two conditions when the two strains grew best go very well. And we tried to use glycerol. 
that you remember uh, I mentioned earlier that this is a biodiesel product, but you can also find it in uh, other types of uh, wastewater. So it would be a way to minimize the additional cost from uh, organic carbon. This is a very nice project uh, where we also have uh, um, partners, other partners, uh, RICE, Napoli, Chalmers, and uh, in Paris. So uh, I will show you some of uh, Valeria's results. So she also used the RICE photobioreactors. But what uh, Otilia didn't do before is that we also grew uh, the cells in phototrophy with just air. So no CO2, just the atmospheric uh, air. And you can clearly see how much slower they grow in these conditions. And in all other conditions, whether you use CO2 rich air or you use mixotrophy, that would be with glycerol and just air, or if you use both glycerol and CO2, they grow uh, quite similarly. Uh, Valeria also looked at the productivity and similar pattern we see here, the biomass is uh, similar in these combinations, either with CO2 or with uh, just glycerol or both of them. Uh, it's about threefold higher productivity we get from uh, air to these conditions. Uh, and you can also see here the colors, uh, the high density of the culture. Uh, we looked at the composition. Uh, this is the composition. It's quite uh, balanced uh, in protein, lipids, and sugars. And here you can see the calorific value. So when we looked at these other uh, three possibilities, we could see actually an increase of about 1.4 in calorific value. Uh, we could also see a slight increase in the lipids uh, and um, not so much uh, for the other components. And when we looked at uh, uh, lipid composition in more detail, we saw some uh, slight changes as well. We see more polyunsaturated fatty acid. And this correlates with an increase in the EPA during mixotrophy. So mixotrophy provides some uh, advantages for the composition. Uh, Valeria has also measured the carotenoids, since we could see in the literature that this can happen. And we could indeed see an increase in the amount of carotenoids, but we need more detailed analysis uh, that will be performed uh, in Napoli. Uh, the lab here will also test our extracts on uh, human cell lines to see if they are able to provide uh, antioxidant um, properties and anti-inflammatory and, and so on. Um, and uh, they eventually they will also look whether our extracts have other bioactive uh, compounds such as vitamins. Okay, what about skeletonema? That uh, we could see it, it grew uh, better than anotropsis in winter, but still not very well. So again, Valeria tried the phototrophy with just air, and you see it grows very poorly. And all the other conditions improve tremendously the growth. The biomass, uh, we can see an increase twofold from the phototrophy plus air. You can see here the colors of the culture. So indeed, glycerol uh, and CO2 are able to similarly uh, boost the biomass. Uh, when it comes to the composition, because we had, as you could see, so poor, uh, so poor growth, uh, we could hardly get any biomass to analyze the composition. So, uh, we are waiting for uh, latest uh, uh, data to be able to say how the biomass composition has been improved compared to this condition. But otherwise, if we compare the three uh, types of combinations, they seem to have similar energy. Uh, maybe they have a, a bit more lipids um, in mixotrophic conditions. 
Cornelia, just to let you know, it's uh, 12.45 now, yes. if you want to leave some uh, minutes for questions. Okay, thank you. So uh, very, very briefly, so our vision, um, what did we want to achieve? Um, what you can see here is that we put together the values for productivity uh, if they are calculated per season. And uh, even if we do mixotrophy, we will improve a little bit the numbers, but overall you can see that the best numbers for energy production are for nanochloropsis. So we think that the bioenergy production is feasible only during the summer. Uh, however, both of these strains could be cultivated uh, year round for different purposes that are listed here. Uh, if one um, use wastewater and do it outdoors and use waste CO2. So the take home messages, we have a, a need in Sweden for biorefineries, seafood farms, industry. And our solution is that we provide knowledge about uh, cultivation of two marine species. Uh, and you can see here again, what they are uh, best for. And what we next intend is to further optimize our cultivation system for these two strains and maybe others for a larger scale, for an outdoor condition. Uh, and we are looking forward for interested partners. And uh, I would like to acknowledge again, Otilia, Valeria, Anna Goudet, that was uh, very uh, important um, in the initial phases of the project. Uh, Mats for analyzing the lipids, Olga providing the strains, and then we have, of course, work ongoing uh, with Mats. And also would like to acknowledge Camila uh, Peteshon from uh, Innovation Office for all the support with our grant applications. Andrea is uh, taking over from her. The RISE team. Uh, I should also mention that our project was listed in EVA 100 list 2020 uh, and to acknowledge our uh, uh, funding. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention with this uh, summer picture from the west coast of Sweden. Thank you.